You know, I don't know. I'm probably, uh, if you think long term, and I can talk about this at great length, uh, um, but long term, the thing, if you take a really long run view, you know, many decades, maybe even a couple of hundred years, I think the most important work that I'm doing, and I get increasing conviction on this with every passing year, is the work I'm doing at Blue Origin okay. on space travel. Okay. Well, why don't, why, don't, why, well, why don't we talk about that? Okay. Um, because I think, I think from a vision standpoint, um, I think people should appreciate the horizon that you have. So yeah. let's talk about your kind of, your, I'll call it your near-term objectives, let's yeah. say 75 years, yeah. and then your long-term objectives 100 to 300 years from now. Well, so first of all, you don't choose your passions, your passions choose you. And all of us are gifted with certain passions, and the people who are lucky are the ones who get to follow those things. And I always advise our uh, young employees, I meet with interns and so on, you can have, and my kids too, you can have a job, or you can have a career, or you can have a calling. And if you can somehow figure out how to have a calling, you have hit the jackpot, because that's the big deal. And uh, most people don't ever get there. You know, you're very lucky if you have a career. A lot of people end up with a job. And so, um, you know, for me, I have been interested in rockets, space travel, propulsion, since I was a five-year-old boy. And I have spent a tremendous amount of time thinking about it. So it's not like I really have a choice to follow this passion. It has captured me. But I think it's very important um, that we go out into space as a civilization. And uh, the reason is not the one that you, that I think is very common. There are many reasons that are, that are given. One of the reasons that is out there, and it's a very old idea, and one of the people who first articulated it um, very uh, well was Arthur C. Clarke. He said, all civilizations become spacefaring or extinct. And that even may be technically true in a long run, kind of long enough horizon. But um, that, um, idea is one of the, it has kind of come to be that we need a, we've got all our eggs in one basket and we need a plan B. You know, if we had a civilization elsewhere on another planet, somewhere in the solar system, then when Earth gets destroyed, humanity will still be fine. I find this particular argument incredibly unmotivating. <laughs> we, we have now sent robotic probes to every planet in this solar system. Believe me, this is the best one. <laughs> it is not close. My friends who want to move to Mars, I say, I have an idea for you. Why don't you first for a year move to the top of Mount Everest? Because the top of Mount Everest is a garden paradise <laughs> compared to Mars. And, um, and so it's a, uh, uh, w this planet is a gym. This planet is unbelievable. And as you travel around, uh, the more you travel around, you, the more you see how incredible it is. And I'm not even just talking about nature. I'm talking about the civilization we built and the urban cities that we have and all of this, this, these amazing things. Um, and so we need to protect it. Now, and I'm not even talking about protecting it from asteroids or nuclear holocaust or anything, so all, the, all those things are probably uh, important and valid. But we don't need to worry about that, because we have something more certain that is a problem. And that is, if you take current baseline energy usage on Earth today, global energy usage, and compound that at just 3% a year, then in just a few hundred years, you're going to have to cover the entire surface of the Earth in solar cells. That's how powerful compounding is. So, and by the way, we have been growing energy usage at a few percent a year for a long time. So, and, and, we, and we, our civilization has a lot of advantages because we increase our energy usage. The human body, if we, in a state of nature, if you are just an animal in the state of nature, your body, your metabolic rate, uses about 100 watts of power. But a modern person living in a developed country, you actually use 
you're, 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 you're all in civilizational per capita metabolic rate is 11,000 watts. We use a lot of energy. That's about as much energy as a blue whale uses. And so we have, you know, there are billions of us, and most of us don't even, aren't even really living uh, in the kind of lifestyle of a developed country yet, but they will be very soon, and we hope they will be. We want them to. And so you're going to face a choice, and you won't face this choice, and I won't face this choice, but your grandchildren's grandchildren will face this choice. Do you want to live in a world of stasis, or do you want to have a trillion humans living in the solar system? Because the solar system is big. Earth is small. We capture a tiny, Earth's surface is so small, it captures a tiny, tiny fraction of the solar output. So once you go out into space, you have, for practical purposes, once again, unlimited resources. And the solar system can easily support a trillion humans. If you had a trillion humans, then you'd have a thousand Mozarts and a thousand Einsteins and so on and so on. That would be a dynamic, incredible civilization in which you would want your grandchildren's grandchildren to live in. I think ultimately Earth becomes zoned, you know, residential and light industrial. <laughs> and, um, you know, we'll have universities here and, and beautiful parks and houses, and, uh, but we won't have big factories here. All of that will be much better done in space where we have access to much higher quality resources. Uh, and so that's going to take several, you know, that's a multi-hundred uh, year uh, vision. And my piece of this vision is I'm taking my Amazon lottery winnings and I'm converting them into reusable rocket vehicles so that we can lower the cost of access to space. Because right now the price of admission to do interesting things in space is just too high. If I look at what Amazon was able to do 20 years ago, we didn't have to build a transportation network. It already existed. That heavy lifting was in place. We didn't have to build a payment system. That heavy lifting had already been done. It was the credit card system. We didn't have to build, um, put a computer at every desk. That had already been done too, mostly for playing games, by the way, and so on. So all the pieces of heavy lifting were already in place 20 years ago. And that's why, as a, with a million dollars, I could start this company. Today, you know, and, and then there are even better examples on the internet over the last 20 years. You know, uh, Facebook started in a dorm room. Uh, I guarantee you two kids cannot build a giant space company in their dorm room. It's impossible. <laughs> But I want to create the heavy lifting infrastructure, kind of do the hard part, so that a future, the future generation, two kids in a dorm room, will be able to create a giant space company. So that's the goal. And then, because, yeah, thank you, you're not gonna, you're not gonna achieve the vision that I just laid out of a trillion humans living in space and having this dynamic world um, without a big industry made up of thousands of companies but it has to start with making the vehicles much more productive. And right now, you use a rocket once and you throw it away, uh, and that is just a very expensive way to do business. So can I talk then uh, about another element with, uh, to get you to discuss your vision? Um, this may not be germane to the work you're doing, but, I'm, but you, are, uh, you are one of the great thinkers. Um, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Pros and cons, we've heard. Um, yeah. People talk about the great benefits. We've heard about disrupting and changing and leaving off us all in, yeah. in a jobless society. We've heard uh, autonomous weapons are a disaster. Yeah. Where do you fall on the uh, on your vision of where in artificial intelligence is going to go, and also um, some of the I think some of the more cautionary, and also some yeah. of the benefits. There. Well, um, you mentioned a few things there. Each of those is worth visiting because they're different. I think. Autonomous weapons are extremely scary. Um, I think it's a big, and you, by the way, do not need um, general AI. So right now, the things that we know how to do, you, would, you should think of those things as what is called narrow AI, um, things like machine vision and so on. To build incredibly scary autonomous weapons, you do not need general AI. The techniques that we already know and understand are perfectly adequate. And these weapons, some of the ideas that people have for these weapons are, in fact, very scary. Um, 
And so I don't know what the solution to that, but smart people need to be thinking about that, doing a lot of R&D. Is there, is there a kind of, uh, you know, multi, uh, it'd have to be a big treaty like the Geneva Convention or something that would help regulate these weapons because you, it, they're actually, uh, they have a lot of issues. So that one I think is genuinely scary. The idea that there's gonna be a general AI overlord that subjugates us or kills us all I think is not something to worry about. I think that is overhyped. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm, first of all, we don't know, we're nowhere close to knowing how to build a general AI, something that could set its own objectives. We have no idea. We, we don't even, it's not even hardly, it's, it's not even a valid research area. We're so, we're so far back on that one. Um, so that's a, I think that's a very long-term prospect that it could even happen. But second of all, I think it's unlikely that such a thing's first instincts would be to exterminate us. Um, it seems, that would seem surprising to me. Maybe I unemploy mean, us. Much more likely it will help us, you know, um, uh, because we you know we're perfectly capable of hurting ourselves. You know, maybe we could use some help. Um, so I'm optimistic about that one and certainly don't think we need to worry about it today. And then the jobless, you know, are we gonna, is AI gonna put everybody out of work? I am not worried about this. I, I, I find that people, all of us, I include myself, we are so unimaginative about what future jobs are going to look like and what they're going to be. You know, if I took you back in time 100 years, when, every, when almost everyone was a farmer, and I told, you know, we're, have, we're at some big farming convention or something, and I say, in the year 2018, there is gonna be a job occupation called massage therapist. <laughs> they would not have believed you. And in fact, I was telling this story to a friend and they said, Jeff, forget massage therapist, there are dog psychiatrists. <laughs> and I, I went, I went- you probably and, find one on Amazon. I went and looked that up on the internet. Sure enough, <laughs> you, you can easily hire a psychiatrist for your dog. And so, what, you know, there is, um, we're, we, 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 humans like to do things and we like to be productive and we will figure out things to do um, and we will use these tools to make ourselves more powerful and, and in fact, what I predict is that jobs will get more engaging. Yes. Because you have to remember, you know, a lot of the jobs today are, are quite routine. Um, they are not necessarily uh, anybody's, as I said before, career or calling. And so I predict that because of um, artificial intelligence and its ability to automate certain tasks that in the past were impossible to automate, that not only will we have a much wealthier civilization, but that the quality of work will go up very significantly and that a higher fraction of people will have callings and careers relative to today.